welcome to Cities on the Move. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Vicki Storley is a genealogist who has traced her family history back to the Mayflower. We'll learn how she combs through history to track her family tree. The Freeborn County Fair is right around the corner, and we'll find out more about how the county fair has evolved since the early 1800s. And we'll pay a visit to Suzanne Crane as she works on her latest project, a mural honoring Madame Beatrice Bessesen. We'll have all this and more coming up on Cities on the Move. Vicki Storley has an obsession for genealogy. She shares with us some of her helpful hints on how to trace your own family tree. My name is Vicki Storley. Um, I live in Clarks Grove, Minnesota. I've lived there for 30 years. I have two children and one grandson. And I work for the City of Albert Lee in the, as a dispatcher in the police department. We dispatch for the City of Albert Lee in Freeborn County. Genealogy is a Researching your ancestors or, you know, finding out where you came from, it's, I mean, it gets to be a real obsession sometimes, finding out where they came from. I've been interested in genealogy for probably over 30 years. Started out with um, just having a typewritten sheet from one of the relatives on who these people were, some of the ancestors were, and uh, going on from there. Uh, some of the resources uh, that are out there to use are Ancestry.com, uh, Genealogy.com, the Family History Library um, in Salt Lake City. Yeah, some of the resources in Freeborn County are the Freeborn County um, Genealogical Society, the Freeborn County Historical Society, and they're kind of housed in the same building out at the museum. A good place to start on your genealogy is with yourself, writing down your information, birth dates, you know, if you're married, your children. Then you go back to your parents, your grandparents, what do you know? Um, and just kind of work backwards from what you know to what you're looking for. One thing they say is to interview relatives while they're still alive so you can get that information. <laughs> I was able to trace my family history on my dad's side back to the Mayflower. So that was a pretty exciting thing when we figured that out. Um, I'm a member of the Minnesota um, Mayflower Descendant Society. I've had the lineage um, approved by them in the, out in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And that really got some of the rest of the family members excited. We went, most of us as a family went out to Plymouth. Going back to like when you say the old country or Norway or, or you know Denmark or something like that, um, a lot of people came through Ellis Island, and there are record, you know, they have an, also a website that's searchable. You have to kind of know where the people came from, have an idea so you can, because you've got to go back to the location, and then some of that's pretty much search. And without even reading Norwegian or Danish, you're a lot of times able to pick up the names or the dates of birth, or because a lot of them have um, baptism records and then they have the birth records or the confirmation records and marriage records there. I really enjoy genealogy and it's more kind of an obsession with me. That's one of the things it is. Um, I like the researching, looking for, and then the ultimate if finding somebody. When you're, you're looking for somebody, whether it's my family or if I research somebody else's, the, the finding them or the elusive person that you find that's kind of really the draw for it. Well, it is definitely fair season, and we have a special guest with us today to talk about the Freeborn County Fair. Mike Moitis is here from the Freeborn County Fair Board. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, fair is just a short time from now. Yes, it is. And some of them actually in the region have started, but you guys are just a couple weeks away. Tell us about when the Freeborn County Fair will take place. Freeborn County Fair is in Albert Lee. It'll start August 4th, and it runs through the 9th. So it's a Tuesday through Sunday event, and uh, lots to see and do, and, of course, great food as well. 
right. Now, you've been with the Fair Board for quite a while. How long has it been now? We're approaching 15 years. Wow. Um, we have seven board of directors uh, amongst the Fair Board, and we each have our own department. My uh, department is in charge of the entertainers, and of course we have a livestock superintendent, a fair manager, and so of the seven of us, we each have our own division. So we all work together, uh, make a board decision, but uh, each individual entity is uh, on its own. Kind of responsible for your own segment of the Yeah, right. yeah. Now, how does that tie into county government? Are you guys a standalone nonprofit? Is this your job? Is this a volunteer activity? Give us a sense of kind of what the fair board's responsibility is. Yeah, the, as I mentioned, there's seven of us. Mm -hmm. um, we do get a small stipend. Um, the county of Freeborn does give us uh, capital money. They own the fairgrounds okay. and we run the fairgrounds for the county. Uh, the county does give us some capital money because of course it's their buildings, it's their grounds, so they want to keep uh, things looking nice. Uh, Freeborn County Board of Commissioners uh, have really worked hand in hand with us. They don't want to run the fair. They say, we'll let you seven people run the fair and uh, we'll go from there. But we do get some help from the county. And, but uh, other than that, we, we really rely on the people to show up uh, during fair time. All right, and this is really a ton of work and it doesn't just happen a couple weeks before the fair starts. Give us a sense of what your year is like. You're right, Stephanie. A lot of people think, well, the fair's in a couple weeks, so they must be getting ready for the fair. Uh, as entertainment director on the Freeborn County Fair, I actually start working on getting the entertainers uh, Thanksgiving before. Oh, wow. um, okay. So I go out to Las Vegas, uh, work with the entertainer managers, and then we kind of choose and throw names out, and uh, usually by December, uh, we pretty much have a good handling on who's coming to the fair for the next year. Okay, and entertainment is kind of one of the star attractions of this particular fair. Tell us a little bit about how you're able to garner such big names to come. A lot of it is our reputation. Uh, we work with an agency called Variety Attractions that we've worked uh, with Bill McGann for, we're approaching 30 years now okay. uh, with Bill, and uh, him and I work well together as far as what is the entertainers that are up and coming. Uh, we've had Garth Brooks uh, back in the late 80s yes. when Garth was really a no name and now all of a sudden now he, he was big and we were able to draw him like that. Dirks Bentley was another one. Um, so we work with variety attractions and try and get the entertainers. The nice thing about the Freeborn County Fair in Albert Lee and the dates that work with us is there's a huge event up in Detroit Lakes called the WeFest and it's real nice in the fact that you have Interstate 35 and Interstate 90. So a lot of these entertainers either go to WeFest in Detroit Lakes and then they come through Albert Lee, or they'll go to WeFest first and then travel south back to Nashville. And that's how we're able to pick up on a lot of these entertainers. It's, it's a routing issue. So okay. uh, a lot so of these entertainers like to go from one location the next day and then just a couple hundred miles away, go to the next one versus trying to stretch it out into weeks and months. So it's a lot of coordination. It's not just who's your favorite one for this time. Yeah, I mean, if, if I had my way, we'd, we'd pick all of the, the great entertainers that kind of our favorite one, from the Kenny Rogers to the Travis Stritz, okay. something like that. But mm -hmm. it's all in the, in the routing. And then, of course, money is a, a big issue with us. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these entertainers, their prices continue to rise. And we have to look at the bottom dollar. We are a nonprofit organization, but we really need to look at make sure that we can get the people in the gates to pay for that entertainers. And we do it on a daily basis. So. Uh, if an entertainer is $50,000, uh, $9 to get in wow. for the gate, uh, we've got to have a lot of people come through the sure. gate just to pay for the entertainment. Wow. And give us the lineup for this year. This year um, we've got a good lineup. On August 4th is Keith Anderson. He's an up-and-coming country artist. Uh, then on Wednesday night we'll have Luke Bryan. Uh, Thursday is probably going to be our biggest night. American Idol Kelly Pickler, oh. uh, she is going to be there on Thursday. Uh, Friday we've got a group, uh, Little Big Town, which is again a country act, mm -hmm. and Saturday will be Travis Tritt. So we've got a star-studded lineup again this year, and we think it'll really draw. We know that the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday are probably our biggest nights. People like to, to come to Albert Lee during the fair time on a weekend. So uh, our big draw this year is Kelly Pickler. It was lucky enough that uh, she's going to be in Albert Lee first and then go to WeFest in Detroit Lakes a couple okay. days later. Sounds good. And about how many people actually come to the fair? We estimate about 100,000 people come to the fair during one week. Um, our grandstand and, and the new seating uh, that has transpired over the last couple of years, we can get about 10,000 people uh, into the grandstand area, and that doesn't include people that want to stand along the fence, or of course we have our beer garden located right next to the grandstand. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, just for seating capacity, we have about 10,000 seats available. And that is a huge, huge structure. 
It is. It was built back years and years ago. In fact, 1904 was when that grandstand was built. Oh my gosh. So it's still holding up. Um, we've done some remodeling, of course, some upkeep over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, then within the last couple of years, we moved the stage back. Uh, last year was the first year for that. Uh, we moved the stage back. We brought in a different stage company, a different light company, and the fact that we're drawing these big name entertainers and we just needed a, a larger venue to try and make things meet. So we did, we did move the stage back and then we built benches and we have to rent chairs. Uh, so we put some black topping and that was about $100,000 capital improvement uh, for the fairgrounds and that was okay. just during the entertainment section. And I suppose those entertainers want a nice facility to play in too. They do. I mean it's not <coughs> going to work with the hay racks, it's uh, uh, with the little <laughs> wagons that come by. Uh, they have specifications in their contracts that mm -hmm. the stage has to be a minimum of 50 by 40, it has to have a roof. Um, so this is the second year that we've had to bring in a new stage. Um, we've had to bring in lights and of course we have a roof uh, for mm -hmm. inclement weather. If it starts to sprinkle a little bit, the entertainers have showed up. They want to perform. So uh, sure. in my close to 15 years, uh, we've only had one rain date where we've collected on rain insurance, but Trace mm -hmm. Atkins actually said, I'm here, I want to play for uh -huh. these people. So. Uh -huh. Uh, they continue to sit in the rain and with their umbrellas and wait for Trace to come out. It was a good show. It was a good show. Well, let's, you know, you talk a little bit about that building being built so long ago. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the fair because this has been going on, was it 1859, your first 1840 fair? was the first Ooh, fair. Okay. Um, there was a time frame during World War II that there were no county fairs in the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a little bit later on, of course, there was a polio epidemic, so there wasn't a county fair. but. Uh, in 1904 is when they built the grandstand, and uh, that was actually the first fair. The Freeborn County Commissioners bought, uh, there's roughly about 50 acres. Uh, in 1904 was the first state fair, or first county fair, I should say, in the state of Minnesota that was run by a county. Um, oh. They purchased uh, 54 acres for around $5,000. So, of course, that was back in 1904, <laughs> so prices money have then. changed, uh, changed quite a bit. Uh, in before that, uh, in the late 1800s, uh, you could actually get into a, the Freeborn County Fair for a dollar a car load uh, or a dollar a wagon load. So uh, okay. it was quite interesting in going back and researching about the Freeborn County Fair. This is a 126th running wow. fair, so uh, it's one of the state's longest running fairs. Great. And how has kind of fair activities, how have they changed over those years? Well, a lot of it, of course, was agricultural. Um, in the early days, they brought in the, the horses. That was a big thing to show horses. Another interesting thing in, uh, way back when is people used to make their own wine. And that was one of the displays that was put out on the Freeborn County Fair is that they had wine classes where people would make their wine, they'd bring it in, and of course it'd be judged. And so okay. that has changed. Uh, agriculture was a huge, huge uh, event going on with the Freeborn mm -hmm. County Fair. Uh, and, you know, with the last 20 years, of course, there was large implement dealers that have kind of drawn back a little bit. Mm -hmm. We still have our machinery hill where mm -hmm. the implement dealers come in and display the tractors and stuff. But it has changed over the years. It's, uh, we have more than just the entertainment at the fair. Uh, of course, the 4-H play a big, big part in our fair, the FFA kids. And uh, so the entertainment is a large draw for us. But we do have the 4-H, we have the FFA, and we have a lot of exhibitors that come in and really support the fair. There, there is, agriculture still is a big part of this particular fair. I know some communities have changed, but uh, in that realm, and I realize entertainment is kind of your specialty, but they have classes that people can come watch. Is that right, where they judge the animals? Right, uh, and on Wednesday night, they'll have the big draft horses that come in in the outdoor yes. arena. Um, usually they have eight to ten uh, groups come in with their large draft horses. That's really something I even enjoyed. I tried to take a little bit of a break from where I'm at mm -hmm. to try to look over at the draft horse show. Uh, they have the regular horse shows, uh, of course, the cattle, they have the steer shows, mm -hmm. the heifer shows, uh, rabbits, poultry. Uh, there's a lot of different things going on behind this area that, from the entertainment, but we all work together to, to make it the best fair in, in the state of Minnesota. Great. And I see you brought your premium book along. Tell us a little bit about what people will find in that book, and is it too late to enter something in the fair, whether it's an animal or an arts and craft project, or what, what kind of information will people find in that book? People in the, in the uh, book will actually find all of the different classes, all of the different lots that uh, Floral Hall is a, is a large uh, gladiolus people like to enter in. You can actually go online to freebornecountyfair.com and people can, there's entry forms, they can actually do it online. Oh, they can, okay. So great. we've changed over the years that they can do it up to fair date. 
uh, to actually put their entries. So if they have okay. cucumbers or tomatoes that they want to enter into a floral hall, they can do that. They can do it online. So you can actually do your registration ahead of time. And of course, the 4-H kids, they have a large exhibit building. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the kids are working on their 4-H projects. Or I should say moms and dads are helping the kids <laughs> work on their 4-H projects. Uh, and so that, that is, again, another entity that has changed over the years. We try to do a lot of the entries online, which is uh, something that people would just show up with their vegetables or mm -hmm. they show up with their little uh, crochet items. Uh, now we've, we've transferred now to the, the Internet marketing way of things, yeah. and people can actually do it online. So the day of, all they have to do is bring their items. Uh, and their paperwork is already set and ready to go. Nice. Very convenient, very convenient. Yes. Well, a big part of County Fair also are kind of the rides. And tell us a little bit about, you always have kind of a midway area for kids, young and old, to play on. We do. We've got, uh, we think, one of the premier uh, carnival operations in the state of Minnesota. Uh, they do play at Moore County Fair in Austin. They play at the Steel County Fair. And they do have some rides to go to Minnesota State Fair. It's uh, Merriman's Midway of Fun. Uh, this would be the third year that we've had them there. Uh, we've struggled in the, in the years past trying to find a carnival that uh, would cooperate. Um, and uh, Merriman's, uh, Todd and Dale just do a fantastic job. They help the advertising ahead of time. They're a clean outfit. They're very respectable in the state and the amusement uh, things. So they do a great job of, of helping us prevent our, from tragedies. We've mm -hmm. had accidents in the past. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have not had one of those uh, now, knock on wood, in five years, <laughs> but uh, that makes it nice when yep. you can work with a carnival outfit that's uh, nice, fantastic. Safe, fun activity. And of course, there's food. There is food, and you know, we're unique uh, in the fact that we try to have local vendors first come in, and then we have outside vendors come in for food. Uh, we've had a lot of vendors that have been there a long, long time. Uh, Bruno's is with the corn dogs, for example. Mm -hmm. But we have service clubs as well. Knights of Columbus usually come in. Mm -hmm. uh, the American Legion this year is going to have a food stand. So we try to put it together so that there's something for everybody, so that you don't have 20 corn dog stands, so you don't have 15 hamburger stands. Um, there will be some unique food items uh, that if people come to the fair, they'll see. One year we had alligator uh, uh, <laughs> on a stick. So there's some new food vendors that sure. are coming in as well. But we try to limit it so that there isn't just corn dogs at the fair. Right. And so when the fair comes, what is your favorite food? My favorite food is the corn dog. It is. I've right. got to have a corn dog. I usually have a corn dog uh, every night of the fair. I take a little bit of a break. and. Uh, of course, I walk up in the grandstand to make sure the sound quality is there. And if it's sure. not, I let people know that you need to turn it down or mm -hmm. you need to turn the vocals up a little bit. Yeah. And keep that balance. Keep the balance. We're ultimately paying for the show. So right. Right. it's a big responsibility. And actually, that big building, besides housing all the people watching the show, there are exhibits underneath. You have quite a few uh, commercial activities going on. We do. We have a lot of the local businesses that come in with their commercial displays, uh, be it vacuum cleaner dealers, uh, from Service Master to the water companies. There are a lot of different local companies. Uh, when you have 100,000 people coming through the gates in one week, that's where they put their advertising dollars to work. A good opportunity for them to showcase their stuff. Now, in that case, uh, is there still space available? Uh, there is space available underneath the grandstand. We also have another commercial building that is already sold out uh, okay. for commercial space. Um, so there is a few booths left. Uh, people can call the fair office at 507-373-6965, uh, and uh, there is a few booths left underneath the grandstand. All right. And Freeborn County Fair does charge admission, but that's a way to get that good entertainment. Tell us a little bit about what the hours of the fair are and what people should expect to pay to get in. This year, to get into the fair, it's $9, um, and that does include the, the shows. Mm -hmm. So for $9, uh, you can see Kelly Pickler. The shows are all at 8.30. But of course, there's other activities to see throughout the fairgrounds. Uh, Wednesday will be Senior Citizens Day. Um, that's $4 for senior citizens. Uh, for the hardcore people that really want to have a reserve seat, we have 500 reserve seats. Um, Thursday night with Kelly Pickler is already sold out. Uh, okay. uh, but we do have room for Travis Tritt on Saturday night and, of course, a little big town on Friday with Luke uh, Bryan and Keith Anderson. Some seats are available, but you can't beat the price. For $9 to see national that's entertainment. Uh, it's unbelievable. Or at this time, you can buy a season pass, which is $36, and that'll get you into the fairgrounds, and the shows, again, are free. Are so all included. So a great value for your dollar. Thank you so much for coming in and telling us. And we didn't even get to everything that's going to be offered at the fair. Thank so you, So it'll be a great time. I hope you will check out the Freeborn County Fair August 4th through the 9th. Stay tuned for more Cities on the Move.
Suzanne Crane is an artist who has purchased one of the most interesting buildings in downtown Albert Lee. Her latest project is to add a mural honoring the building's inspiration. Let's take a look. On a beautiful summer's evening, a window opens. A woman steps forward and from a raised balcony, she sings to the people. Avita of Argentina? Maria Callas of Italy? Well, actually, it was Madame Beatrice Bessesson of Albert Lee, Minnesota. Suzanne Crane is an artist who's taking on a personal mission to remind local residents that Albert Lee has been home to some very famous people, particularly in the arts. As the current owner of the Bessesson Opera Palace, she's using her own artistic talents to bring that history to life. Suzanne always knew she wanted to communicate through art. When I was four years old, I saw my mom painting a picture and I had never painted anything in my life. And I said, I'm going to be an artist when I grow up. And I'm sure they were thinking, sure, sure, okay, you know, whatever, you're four. And um, later I went to art school and it's, it's just always what I wanted to do. Um, I was a double major, English and art, and I like creative writing. I also like other media besides painting. I, I did silversmithing and some sculpture, but painting has really taken me pretty far. And it is this love of painting that sparked a new idea. Suzanne purchased the Bessesson Opera Palace in 2005 and immediately began making plans for its restoration. I have the fortune to have the Opera Palace built for Beatrice Bessesson, a, fa a famous opera singer and its facade is French Renaissance. It's very inspiring architecture to me. I love architecture. I've always loved architecture, and um, I've been to Europe a few times, and I'm very inspired by the architecture there. And to find this facade, this building here, was, was a real treat. The building fit my needs. It, it, it fits, I, I'd like to create a, a venue, I'd like to have a studio, and I'd like to have it be big enough to include other artists and other programming beyond what I do. Historic preservation is near and dear to my heart. I feel like if we're ever going to have any glorious history here that we can look back on and, and with pride and dignity, we need to start preserving it now. These turn-of-the-century buildings are in great need of repair, and they're disappearing. As she worked on the building's restoration plan, the story of Madame Bessesson came to life for Suzanne. She had, of course, beautiful brown hair, and she was Scandinavian Bohemian, and her name was Jersten before it was Bessesson. That's her married name. Um, she became famous before she was married. When her career started as an opera singer, she toured Europe. She was in the Royal German Opera Company in Berlin, she was the favorite soprano of Kaiser Wilhelm, and he actually gave her a huge diamond brooch when she was married. Um, he was very generous with her, and I think that that part of her life was something that she brought to Albert Lee because there's a lot of references to Germanic theater in the early programs that she did. The first program that happened in the building was Tannhauser and it means forest dweller. It's sort of like a Germanic Midsummer Night's Dream. After settling in Albert Lee, Beatrice's new husband built the Opera Palace to accommodate her musical talents. She taught singing, acting, opera, um, all from the second floor here. And originally the building only had two floors. I think it was around 1921 that they put the third floor on. When people were out on the street and she was opening the building, she would just sort of open the windows and then sing out, and uh, she was known for doing this. She, I guess, had a pretty exuberant spirit, and I just think she's a very inspirational character for Albert Lee, and I don't think very many people know that she was here and that, that things like this can happen here. Suzanne is painting a mural to recapture those impromptu moments. The mural will be on the south wall third floor and it will be overlooking Broadway and Main and she's sort of her face is sort of angled out so that she's looking towards the people on the street. It won't be painted onto the building or in any way 
you know, a part of the structure. It will just be affixed to the building. Suzanne Crane, one more person bringing history forward and keeping Albert Lee, a city on the move. Cities on the Move is on the web. Make a comment, ask a question, or share your good idea by visiting our website at ksmq.org. Summer is a busy time, and here are a few events that you may want to check out in the coming weeks. Now, the Albert Lee Farmer's Market is in full swing on Wednesdays from 4 to 6 p.m. and Saturdays from 9 a.m. to noon. Enjoy a variety of fresh, locally grown produce. Expected produce includes beans, beets, broccoli, corn, cauliflower, cucumbers, eggplants, flowers, herbs, and the list goes on. Also available are fresh baked goods. The Farmer's Market is located at the North Broadway parking lot. On July 31st at 8.30 p.m., join Albert Lee Parks and Recreation for a great family movie at the Edgewater Park Band Shelf. Take a seat on the bench or bring your lawn chairs and blankets and relax and enjoy the show featuring Charlotte's Web. And this is a free event. The Freeborn County Fair will be held August 4th through the 9th in Albert Lee, Minnesota. The Six Best Days of Summer features nationally known musical talent, antique tractor show, 4-H displays, 4-H FFA, and open class livestock shows, fabulous foods, and much, much more. For more information, visit them online at freebornccountyfair.org. And to share your event, visit us at ksnq.org and register it today. Next week on Cities on the Move, we will meet Gareth Johnson, a senior at Triton High School. Gareth is a black belt in Taekwondo. We will also revisit our discussion of one-minute clinics. Dispensing health care for minor illnesses with convenient locations and hours, these new clinics are popping up in communities around the region. And finally, we'll look at the great birding opportunities we have along the Mississippi River. Please join us Tuesday, July 28th at 6.30 p.m. for another edition of Cities on the Move. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. Good night. Production of this program is made possible in part through a grant from the City of Albert Lee and the Blandon Foundation.